Good morning, Mount Calvary family. On the second day after Easter 2021, um, it is my pleasure to be with you and worship with you this morning to give Pastor Kristen uh, a week off. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kelsey Cress, and I am a lifelong member of Mount Calvary um, and finishing up my senior year uh, at seminary in Chicago. Um, and I'm excited to be worshiping with you this morning. So I welcome you uh, into worship this morning with me. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for the waters where you make us new, leading us from death into life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth. Like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of these believed, who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and, grace, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we're reading from Psalm 133 this morning. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live, live together in, in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon flowing down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And our second reading is from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's gospel reading is according to John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with him. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I have to say that the story of Thomas and the disciples being shut inside a house may never resonate with me more than it has through this year during this continued COVID-19 world we are living in together. I have felt this swirling of phrases that may have also applied to how the disciples were speaking to each other in the days after Jesus' resurrection. This is wild. It's a crazy world we're living in. What do we do now? Is it safe for us to be out in the world yet? How will we know when it is really okay to go out? I found myself imagining the place where they gathered to be safe together looked like, and what it would have been like for Jesus to appear and stand among them unexpectedly, amongst the disciples, and wish them, peace be with you. Peace in a scary world. Peace in an uncertain world. Their community is scattered. They're spending time in locked rooms for fear of their lives and the lives of their friends. Everyone is getting conflicting information. Who should they believe? Is it safe to go out? When can they really go back to their normal lives? What about the things that they'd learned? What about the work that they were called to? What about helping others? What do we do now? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus when going out and helping your neighbor could put someone else at risk. When Jesus appears and stands among them, breathes on them, fills them with the Holy Spirit, says, peace be with you, and tells his disciples to go out and forgive sins. What a relief it must have been for them to see him, to hear his voice, to receive that call, that blessing. A moment of peace in an impossible situation. I imagine them all taking this collective deep breath. And they begin to settle into their new lives. Jesus gives them a thing that they can do, the thing that they are called to. But there's a problem. Thomas is missing, and he wasn't there to see Jesus. They tell him, but he finds it hard to believe. He finds it hard to believe in the things that he hasn't seen, the things he hasn't experienced for himself. The many varied and far-reaching realities of a continued COVID-19 pandemic are also hard for us to believe. It's hard to believe that this country is still not back to normal. It's hard to believe that some of those who have died from the virus have yet to be fully laid to rest in a traditional way. It's hard to believe that restrictions are being lifted while the virus and its variants are still spreading rapidly. 
It's hard to believe that anyone would contradict or question the advice of disease experts. It's hard to believe that schools still aren't back to normal. It's hard to believe that we've spent a second Easter outside of our sanctuary. It's hard to believe that the vaccine still isn't reaching some of the most vulnerable in this country. It's hard to believe that we will ever truly go back to normal. Jesus' resurrection was hard to believe too. It may not be hard for us to believe because we experience it every Easter season, every week on Sunday, because we are, of course, a resurrection people. But in Thomas's world where everything had been turned upside down, Thomas struggled to believe what other people told him. It was hard for Thomas to believe in the resurrection, in the changing of the world, in the new journey that they were all on. The rest of the disciples hadn't recognized Christ until they saw the wounds. So it's not surprising that Thomas goes so far as to declare that he will not believe unless he sees Christ's wounds for himself. It is difficult for us to believe the things we cannot see, the things we cannot touch, but Christ's presence in our life, it is not entirely intangible. This week, as I often do, I looked up and searched through images that were related to the text for the Bible lesson for this week. And as I looked at those images of the doubting Thomas, I was greatly struck by the diversity of portrayals and the compositions of the pieces that I saw. And I think that one distinct difference in portrayals of this scene gets at one of the most important questions that we deal with as Christians. I think that it gets at the old, age-old question of faith. On what is faith based? Is faith based on what we are told? Is it based on what we see? On what we physically experience? One of the biggest differences in these portrayals of doubting Thomas is whether or not the figure of Thomas actually touches Jesus or not. In some of those pieces that I looked at, he does. He touches the risen Christ, but in some he doesn't. In a couple of them, it's actually unclear whether he touches him or not. And the Gospel of John, that's unclear about whether Thomas actually touches Jesus or not either. Thomas sees Jesus because Jesus makes a point to come to see the disciples when Thomas is there. Thomas sees the risen Christ, and I imagine that Thomas has such a look of disbelief on his face that Jesus then had to instruct him to touch the wounds. I imagine Thomas dumbfounded, shocked, unable to register what his own eyes were showing him. Jesus offers the wounds from the, crucif from the crucifixion to Thomas, as al almost as if to say, Thomas, it's okay. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's difficult to have faith, but I am here. I am with you. You can touch me. But the scripture doesn't tell us whether or not Jesus reached out to touch Je Thomas reached out to touch Jesus. Thomas instead declares that Jesus is Lord. So if the gospel doesn't actually say whether Thomas reaches out to touch Jesus, then why do most all of the images that I looked at depict Thomas reaching out? I think the question that these artists are getting at is also a great question for us today. We are also invited to reach out and touch Jesus in times of incredulous doubt, when we cannot believe what we see, when we need to feel anchored to something or someone. Jesus seeks us out to accompany us on the faith journey and encourages us to reach towards him too. We, like Thomas, seek the affirmation of our faith in something that we haven't seen. We may never see the risen Christ standing in front of us. We may never get to push our fingers into Jesus' wounds like Thomas does in a painting. But we do get to encounter Christ in real and tangible ways. We get to encounter the risen Christ in our neighbor and in the inbreaking of the Holy Spirit into our lives. We get to touch Christ in the work that we do here to bring the kingdom of God. We see the inbreaking of Christ in the development of a vaccine that is saving lives all over the world and in the kindness that we have shown each other during this time and in the ways that we've been creative to be able to worship and be in fellowship with each other. And the risen Christ is alive in us too for the care of our neighbor. And just as Christ comes back to see Thomas to show Thomas his wounds, Christ accompanies and seeks us out too, telling us, peace be with you. 
showing Christ's self to us in the many and various encounters that we have with our neighbors, especially in times of doubt. We, as followers of Christ, get to go out into the world and forgive sins, care for our neighbor, tell people about Jesus along with the disciples. As our country begins to move towards being more open and as cases decrease, we are freer to be out in the world to share that good news of Jesus' resurrection and to be the good news of Christ in the lives of our neighbors. So peace be with you. Go out and share the good news of the risen Christ. Amen. I'll invite you to confess your faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Creator Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Creator. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the, in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. You shower your church with grace, O God. Unite the whole church on earth so that with one heart it testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with power and love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You proclaim the blessing of life forevermore. Like dew upon the mountains, refresh your creation. Restore waters, cleanse the air, and provide revitalizing moisture to parched land. Give your whole creation the promise of new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You direct the nations, O God, guide all authority, that they shepherd their peoples in the ways of your love. Defeat in us our impulse to war. Bestow the peace of Christ upon those in authority and breathe upon the, them the Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You place within the heart of the church a spirit of sharing. Give us the power of your generous spirit that we may provide for the needs of others. Announce your peace to those who are lonely, hurting, suffering, or afraid, especially Bob, Ruth, Doreen, Leona, Erlene, Jan, Sarah, Joanne, Barb, Dot, Judy, Janet, Sandy, Ed, Pastor Mumford, Doug, Joan, Sue, Karen, Nels, Ron, Patricia, Jim, Nick, Brian, Tressa, Denise, Dr. Sion, Cindy, Kay, Jane, Pastor Washell, Bishop Lozano, Iona, Amy, Brian, Betty, Yvette, Rod, Jennifer, Sarah, Zoe, and the family of Richard Mando. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You give us fellowship with one another in this faith community. Shine the light of the risen Christ in our life together so that we may live in love for one another and our joy may be complete. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You share the gift of eternal life. In thanksgiving and remembrance, we recall the lives and gifts of those who now live in endless joy. Unite us with them in resurrection hope. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Thanks for joining me in worship today, um, and I will see you all around. Bye.